I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Tamara Kling. Tamara? Well, hello. As you heard, my name is Tamara Kling. I work for CT Corporation, which is part of Walters Kluwer. Today we're going to talk about alternative entities. There have been a lot of new entities that have been formed or have become, become of interest in the last few years. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A. If I can answer them during the phone call, I will. Otherwise, you will receive, everyone will receive answers to whatever questions were submitted and not answered. I know there's going to be a lot of information. If you have questions at a later date, feel free to contact me. I am in the Chicago office. My number here is 800-475-1212, and I can help you if you have any questions regarding this seminar. So where do we begin with alternative entities? Well, the overview is we're going to talk about why are there so many statutory business entities today? There's a lot to choose from, and you have a lot of decisions to make. Some of them include the series LLC, and then there is what is called social enterprise entities, mostly the public benefit corporation. I'm going to talk about that, and then a few others as well. Some other items of interest are the master limited partnership and then shareholder friendly publicly traded corporations which there are some, perhaps. We'll go into that later. Um, after I give you the overview and the beginning, we are actually going to switch and go to the Master Limited Partnership section, and then we will return to the series LLC. So why do you have to know about all these entities? There's a lot of factors you have to use when determining to form a business. First of all, what kind of type of business? What will it be? Is it a, a chemical company? Is it a few friends that are getting together to open a bar? Is it retail, wholesale? And that would come in with the business purpose as well. Then what taxation issues are there? And we'll go through those. Excuse me? Um, we'll talk about who the owners are. Who owns the business? You know, is it an arm's length transaction? Is it friends? Is it family? what kind of management structure you want, how long will this go on, and a lot of other factors as well. So these are some of the things you think about when you're forming any kind of business. Another thing to think about is you may, your customer, your client, they may not be a business owner. They may be the investor who's funding the new business, and they have a lot of needs as well. So think of yourself both as a business owner and an investor, or at least representing those sides. The good thing about having so many entities is with all those choices, you can find a good fit. But the bad thing about these entity types is there are so many choices and it can be hard to decide. Um, and you have to keep up with legal blogs, legal information, the statutes, statutes change a little bit state by state. So you do need to have expertise on these entities. It also doesn't hurt if you have someone in your office who throws an idea out wants to know if the series LLC is a good idea for them. They may just have read about it, but you can give them a brief rundown on it and you will show your clients that you are very up to date on these entity types. Well, why do the states bother? It's the state legislatures that create these entities. The American Bar Association, they have um, Corporation Acts, the National uh, Nicuzel, another national organization, they have model acts. So there's a lot of people beyond the legislatures that are pushing for this. Sometimes it's investors. Um, but the states want to do it to provide an economic benefit to their, to their citizens, either tax or perhaps employment. Um, it would benefit people who want to start a new business. And it would encourage investment, which states also like as well. Again, you may have to hire employees, and it creates revenue through filing taxes. And then the trickle-down effect that they may do business with other businesses within that state. So 
states do have a good reason for authorizing these different entity types. They tend to keep up with one another. You know, one reason may be that your state follows Delaware law, which isn't too common, or that your state, the neighboring state has adopted something and the constituents in the other state think they need it or the, the business bar is driving it. So I want to find out why everyone is here today. The first polling question, do you have a lot of knowledge and wish to learn more? Um, do you know a little about the topic? Or um, this really isn't your field, but you wish to keep up and be informed? Okay, well, we have a good spread here. We have people who know a lot. We have people who want to learn more, and then people who are just keeping themselves professionally up to date. So there's going to be something here for everyone. Even someone who knows a lot may learn from the examples, and you may not have read, I'm going to go into case law a little bit, and you may not have seen these cases. To know where we are, it's important to start with the history of how business entities were created in the states. Until the mid-19th century, most businesses were conducted by individuals, either as partnerships or as sole proprietorships. Well, the problem became that the, the, what happened was the, the country was changing economically with the advent of the railroads and the Industrial Revolution, and things were no longer just done by a few people in their own town. Businesses began to branch along state lines. So the problem was that if you are a partner or a sole proprietor, you are liable for the debts of the business, and that liability is unlimited. So the result was only the very rich could start a business. Um, investors were hard to find because they knew how much could be lost. And there were not very many risky ventures because neither the, invent the investors nor the people starting the business wanted to risk everything. So the solution was to give some protection to the owners of the business. And they came up with a corporation. Um, business owners, investors, their liability is limited. They cannot be held for the torts, the, the breach of contract, or any wrongdoing on behalf of the corporation. The corporation has its own identity, and it's liable for its own debts. For the most part, the only amount that a shareholder can lose is the amount of the investment, the amount of stock that they bought. As this began, businesses started to bloom, and the economy grew. So the Business Corporation Act of most states were very important to help in the development and growth of the economy. Um, the corporation, however, it didn't meet every business need. One of the problems was double taxation. The corporation is taxed on its income, and then any income that is distributed to the stockholders is taxed as well. There's also burdensome management requirements and shareholders, creditors have the right to attach stock. If you have a small corporation and only a few stockholders, the, a judgment creditor can attach the stock of one of its, its, someone who is in debt to them, and then vote to liquidate the corporation using that shareholder share to pay off the debt. The solution to that became the limited partnership. It met various needs of business as well. It had a general partner who operated it, and then passive members who invested in it, but they had limited liability because they were only passive investors. There was only one level of taxation. It, it flowed through to these investors. Um, management was far more flexible, and unlike um, the corporation stock, um, creditors were limited to a charging order. So that protected the LP as well. Um, some other entities came along. 
as the time went by. Some states, not all, have the statutory close corporation. What that means is the business owners, if they want to manage the business and have limitations and liability, they can vote to make it a close corporation, whereas the stockholders, rather than officers and directors, are responsible for the operation of the corporation. Also, the professional corporation. There were a lot of restrictions and still are on medical, dental, all kinds of different health provider and other professionals. Um, they wanted to have that limited liability and they wanted to be able to duck, deduct fringe benefits. So the professional corporation was formed. There's also the S corporation. It's really not a separate corporation. It was just something created by Congress to help smaller families or, or groups that owned business corporations. So it met the need of a small business that wanted to have limited liability with a single level of taxation. But there were a lot of requirements on the shareholders, such as the number of shareholders. The shareholders, for the most part, had to be individual U.S. citizens, and there were other requirements as well. So it didn't fit every business type. Um, so a lot of business owners over the years saw this kind of taxation, and they wanted it too. They also wanted to have some kind of flexible man management. The problem is nothing like that existed. What came to the rescue was the limited liability company. It gives you a single taxation, that is, the entity itself is not taxed, but when the members receive a distribution, they are taxed. The members and managers, or whoever is responsible for the operation of the LLC, have the right to manage it, and they have limited liability. Creditors are, um, judgment creditors are limited to a charging order. The, especially uh, the states really see this as a pick your partner. You have the right to your partner and your partner isn't your creditors, your partner's creditor. Management is very flexible. Um, it doesn't have all the requirements of corporations. It doesn't have all the, the um, you know, the annual meeting. All these things are not required. You can have them in LLC. Perhaps some of your initial member investors want it, but this would be in the operating agreement of the LLC. It wouldn't be by statute. Um, another thing is some people like the way the partnerships formed, but they wanted limited liability for the partnership. So a limited liability partnership is like a general partnership, except the partners aren't liable. Uh, and then there's the, the triple LP, the limited liability limited partnership, that is like a limited partnership, but it gives liability protection to both the general and the limited partners. So as you can see, there are certainly many, many entities where you can protect the owners from being liable from most of the debts of the corporation. There are a few special examples called piercing the corporate veil when the owners have some done something so egregious that they are not allowed to have that protection. But that's a rare, uh, it's rare to occur, and it's definitely fact-based. And if you read any of the case law that comes from it, it's, it's pretty interesting, and you can see that it's very much limited to the facts of that case. So some of the new alternate entities I'm going to talk about, the series LLC, benefit corporations, uh, the limited liability limited company, unincorporated nonprofit associations, cooperative, all of these new entities are around. Now, I'm not going to discuss all of them. The big ones that we'll talk about today are the Series LLC, the Public Benefit Corporation, and the Master Limited Partnership. So now I would direct you to go to, I'm going to take you to one of the final slides, I want to talk about the Master Limited Partnership. That's got a lot of interest lately, and a lot of our clients have been asking us about that. It's kind of, it's interesting. It's a limited partnership, but it's traded on a national exchange. I'm going to try to go faster here. And I can't. 
Sorry. Is there any way you can push me to the end, Amanda? Yes, that's one second. I'll get you there. Okay. And then I'll go back. It's only a few slides. Thanks. Can you tell me whereabouts you need to be? Uh, try for 90. Okay. And I'm gonna go, yes, now let me just go back. Okay, now we are ready to talk about the Master Limited Partnership. It's, it's kind of an interesting vehicle and it's often used for investment purposes. It's traded, um, it's publicly traded which is a little bit different. It's a typical limited partnership with some other qualifications that make it necessary. Um, so with a master limited partnership, it's not really new. It's been around since 1981. Um, originally, they operated in a variety of in, uh, industries, you know, casinos, resorts, sport teams, Boston Celtics, if you're a fan. But in 1987, the tax law changed, and it restricted the use of these to natural resource-based activities. 90% um, of the cash flow has to come from real estate, natural resources, and commodities. Today, with the energy boom, there are a lot of MLPs that are supporting the oil and gas industry, and I'll go into that a little bit. Um, currently, you can see there are... 100 MLPs on the market um, with a capitalization of $400 billion. These are sort of a boutique investment, but they can be very advantageous. Um, it provides the tax advantages of the partnership with the liquidity of a publicly traded company. So the MLP has some liquidity, and the partners, the limited partners, when they receive their money, they are taxed on whatever distribution it makes. So it's operated like a limited partnership. Um, the only thing is the general partner, um, the custom is that the general partner who operates it is compensation, his, rela his compensation is related to performance. So the performance of the venture determines his compensation. So what is this master limited partnership? Um, if you want to form one, you file a certificate of limited partnership. Most are done in Delaware. Um, it's subject to the same name compliance requirements of any other limited partnership. Since these are not generally public facing, it's not too hard to come up with a name. Um, you have to have a registered agent. You have to qualify to do business in other states and you have to file an annual report. Um, and then the advantage is you can be listed on a major stock exchange. And about two thirds, as you can see, are on the New York or the NASDAQ. The big thing is they are not subject to corporate taxation. Um, they can be engaged in the transportation, storage, process of minerals, and natural resources. And again, the LP has to receive at least 90% of its income from natural um, resource-based activities. So a few more things about that. I was researching that and I looked in Business Week from 2014, July, tw or uh, let's see, March 20th, 2014, and they, they had the story of a man named Jack Johns. He was a retired postal worker and he put $50,000 into um, MLP after reading about it on the internet. Well, internally I groaned. I didn't want to read any more. I didn't want to hear how this retired postal worker lost $50,000 to uh, something he didn't understand. Well, that was different. In that year, he earned a 16% return or $8,000. He attributed that to blind luck. And I think that is the case because later in the article, they talk about how um, he sold his interest in the LP because he didn't understand it, but he did make a nice income. Um, over the past five years, 
the uh, Standard & Poor Index for, M, uh, for MLPs returned 28% annually, which is huge, and they are not returning like that this year. From what I checked today, it looks like they're in the 4 to 8% return, which is very good in this economy. Um, the MLPs have been really helped by the energy boom with fracking, horizontal drilling, natural gas. They, prevent, they provide all kinds of things that support the oil companies for their drilling, for pipelines, for transportation. Um, they basically are um, the infrastructure for this industry. Um, it's also popular in Wall Street. It was kind of interesting. What I learned was um, because most of the income is distributed to investors, and again, it's not required. That's just the custom or expectation. The need to grow requires borrowing money, um, and borrowing can be expensive. There was a Bloomberg report in 2013 that said um, Wall Street banks earn transactional fees of $890 million. So that also tells you why there is another reason MLPs are being pushed. Well, they can also go wrong. There was a company called, and it still exists, in February. It was called Boardwalk Pipeline Partners, publicly traded. Um, the Houston-based company, it had announced that it would be cutting its payout to investors. And at that point, the shares dropped by 46%. It went from being a $3.1 billion company to, and it lost, uh, to being a two, oh, I'm sorry, it went from being a $5.9 billion company to a $3.1 billion company. And I just checked E-Trade today, and yesterday the stock closed at $15.28. And um, I also tried to find some famous master limited partnerships. There weren't a whole lot. Um, I saw that Sunoco has a company called Sunoco Logistics Partners. There is the Carlisle Group. There is one called Magellan. And then there's the Shell Midstream Partners. So it looks like some big companies are forming MLPs to provide for their infrastructure. And the last thing I'll say is investors, even though they are the, maybe a limited partner, they are referred to as unit holders. So now I would like to go back to the series LLC. Could you take me there, Amanda? Probably about eight. Sure, I'll do that right now for you. Okay, thanks. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about the Series LLC. That's another investment and business tool that is becoming increasingly popular. And Series LLC is just a limited liability company. Um, it's formed under the laws of a state that authorizes it. So sometimes it has its separate law. Sometimes it's just within the LLC law itself. Um, it consists of series that functions like a separate LLC. So there may be, and I'll show you other, other um, examples of this, but there will be a master LLC, and then it will have series. And each series can have its own assets, liabilities, business purpose, members, managers, contracts, uh, debts, and borrowing rights. So the series LLC does solve some problems, as I mentioned. Some corporations, LLCs, and other entities, they, do, they own more than one business or one, more than one piece of property. And you know, from the beginning, we're always told to hold real estate in separate entities, that two pieces of real estate should not be owned by the same entity. Um, and the debts and liabilities associated with the business or property um, can be as associated or uh, set aside with the assets of another business or property. So if you own a company that has several divisions and one division has a lot of liability, 
it doesn't matter that you're separately accounting the money and keeping money in another um, aspect of your business as well. You may separate it for accounting or business purposes, but a plaintiff trying to collect on liability would not have to do that. So with the series LLC, the entity can place uh, each business or property in a separate subsidiary and it can shield the other series from liabilities. One of the reasons for this is to save money. Um, it can be very expensive if you have hundreds of pieces of real estate or hundreds of pe pieces of property you want to keep separate. You have to do the formation, you have to file, and you will have to do an annual report and maintenance fees for each of these. The series LLC, it provides that in a property, properly formed and maintained series, each business or property, the series, each series, may be contained separately, and each separated group can have its own assets and liabilities that are protected from the liabilities of other groups. So if you have a very successful series and one that's not doing so well, the one that's not doing so well, if it has large liabilities, the creditor cannot go after that series that is doing well. And this just gives you an example of how organizational costs can be. Um, you have an oil company, uh, you have a Texas LLC, and it owns five oil fields. They want to protect each oil field from the other. They want to have some kind of separation. Well, they can either form five separate LLCs, which each LLC would own one field, and the total organization cost for that would be about $1,500. Or they can form a series LLC, establish five series, one per oil field, with a total organizational cost of $300. So as you can see, there's a, a large difference. These are some of the terminology. Each state, different commentators, uh, different attorneys refer to it differently. The series LLC can be called the, the master, the parent, um, just showing that it, it is the larger LLC itself that owns the series. And then the series are sometimes called, usually they're called series actually, but sometimes they can be called cells or subsidiaries, um, baskets, units, whatever the commentator is saying. And you definitely need to check the law in your state to make sure that you're using proper language. So these are some of the things you should see. Um, a series LLC, it's a separation of assets, liabilities, owners, and management in a single entity. Um, so they may call it achieving the series. They may call it segregation or, or partnering or per positioning, you know. But you have to be careful because sometimes a state will use the term series in a similar way. Series is used in the corporation statutes. Um, it authorizes the creation of a series of interests within the classes which have different rights. So you can have stocks that are paid first, stocks that are paid more, things like that. Series of stockholders are not the same as series in an LLC. So there may be uses for a series. Um, the, the example we give is owners of real estate, um, Obviously, you're advised to hold each piece separately. But if you have a series LLC, you can have each series holding a separate discrete piece of property. So in theory, if you do everything right, um, uh, if then there's liability on one property, they cannot go after the other series to pay the liability. Also, it can be done for ownership of personal property, um, large business equipment, machinery, backhoes, you know, huge business things, or personal property like airplanes or boats. That is a common theme that you'll see. So I want to know, do you frequently use the series in your practice um, or rarely or never? If everyone can please make sure they cast their vote, go ahead and click on one of the two answers and click Submit. If you're not able to answer the polling question, 
please type your answer in the Q&A box in the lower left-hand corner, but only use the Q&A box if you're not able to cast your vote. Okay. Well, it looks like most people do not use this in their practice. That doesn't surprise me too much. There are a few firms that actively use it and are very interested in it, but it's a bit of a, a boutique or a niche item. So there's possible uses. Um, the main is to separate business ventures from business assets. So if you have a client who owns a bakery, um, the building where the bakery is located, ovens, and other baking equipment, you can form a series and place the bakery, the real property, and the equipment in separate series. So an example, with this client, if they own three bakeries, they could also form a series LLC and assign each bakery their own series. It's commonly used for holding securities. Um, this concept of the series originated from the mutual fund investment arena concept, where it's a master trust and then several series, each with their own investment objective. So you could have something in, in energy, something in emerging markets, something in uh, traditional business, you know, however you wanted your portfolio of securities to look. And they would each have separate managers and owners. So that's kind of where the concept comes from. It's also used in captive insurance. So the example we have is a venture capitalist invests in four tech startups. And he assigns shares to four different series. So the venture capitalist, he has, he's the master of the series LLC, and then these investments are protected from one another. So this is just kind of a brief rundown of the states that authorize the series LLC, mainly in Delaware, as you can see. And the Illinois series, I'll talk about that a little bit. That's become quite popular as well. So with Delaware, it's the most important jurisdiction for corporations and LLCs and now for the series LLCs. As of the end of 2013, there were approximately 7,500 total um, and 1,100 formed in 2013. So I like to see real numbers to know what's going on. And, and this isn't a huge number for Delaware, but it does tell you that there are some law firms that are rather fond of it. Um, the series law in Delaware came from the Business Trust Act. Now they have what's called the Delaware Statutory Trust. And it was used in transactions for mutual funds and highly uh, financed asset securitizations. So this brought savings for the mutual fund. Only the master trust had to file the SEC registration rather than each fund. So that was probably the driving force behind it. A series LLC is subject to the same naming requirements as a regular LLC. This generally isn't a problem like with the master limited partnership. It's generally not public facing, so a boring name is not necessarily harmful. Um, it can be formed to carry on any lawful business, perfect uh, purpose activity, um, or even you can have a nonprofit series LLC, but they cannot engage in banking. So even Delaware has its limits. They file an annual franchise report and pay taxes. And the annual report is $300. So you can see if you want to, if you've got 10 units and you want to save a little money, you can create a series LLC where the series will pay $300, not the 10 units each paying $300. Also, the series has to appoint and maintain a registered agent. But there's a lot of statutory provisions that have not yet been addressed, or I should say that are not there. Um, you have to have an LLC agreement, just like you have with any other LLC. It can be written, it can be oral, and it can even be imputed. That generally doesn't happen with the series. Um, the main governing document, um, you have to establish your series within the LLC agreement. 
which would set forth the rights of the members of the series, management for the, each series, classes or groups that are established, and then how the series are terminated. You know, what if you have series that a series owns a piece of property? If they sell the property, you still have to shut down the series. The series exists whether it owns anything or not. So you file a certificate of formation in Delaware. Um, all the usual stuff, name, registered agent, um, notice of limitations on the liability of series, that's important <coughs> because you're disclosing to the public that it is a series LLC. Um, filing the certificate of formation then is considered constructive notice of the limitation of liabilities of each series. There's a filing fee of $90. So they're relatively easy to form. Um, this is just the Delaware code. Um, I'm not going to read it to you, but if you do everything you're supposed to do, such as separating the powers, the rights, and the duties to each series, um, have separate business purposes, separate objectives, then if you do that properly, each series can be sue, can sue or be sued, um, have assets, all these things can happen. Um, but the statute doesn't provide a series as a separate entity under state law. So we don't know how it will be treated in foreign states, and we'll get to that quite soon. Um, the limitation of liability, if you do it properly, um, if the LLC agreement creates a series or one of more, um, there's notice of limitation of liability set forth in the formation. Separate and distinct records are maintained. And then the assets associated with each series will be protected from the liabilities of the other series. Now, there's, there's a lot to do with this, and you have to make sure that you really are operating your series separately. Um, members of a series, they have contractual freedom to decide their financial and management rights and duties. They can agree to be personally liable for the debts of a series. You know, you go for, you need funding and you go for a loan at the bank and you tell them you have this series and you need to get a mortgage for the property you want to buy and that you are free from liability, that the series or the LLC itself is liable. And the bank may say, well, that may be true, but we also want you to agree to be personally liable. And if you do not do that, then we don't want to loan you the money. And voting rights can be spread out as well. So this just goes with how um, management, how the series are managed. And it's not really that different from the regular Delaware LLC managerial requirements. Um, distributions can be made unless they will make the series liabilities exceed the fair value of assets. So you can't bankrupt a series just to pay distributions. Um, in any event that would cause a member or manager to cease association would not cause the dissociation with any other series. So you can have a member or manager leave the series, or you can have the series itself dissolve, and there will be no un impact on the other series. Well, a series LLC may find that it's not doing the business you thought it did, or maybe all the property has been sold, so you want to terminate. Um, if the master series is dissolved, each series still has to be terminated, has to terminate its fares and wind up. Um, if the LLC is dissolved, the series must be terminated and wound up. Um, and it's just like LLCs, generally. Um, it could occur at a specified time due to a specified event, um, consent of two-thirds of the members, or it can be a time that there are no members um, living and the personal representative of the last member doesn't consent to continue. You may not want to form an LLC, uh, series LLC outright. 
you have the right to amend the certificate of formation and create a series from that um, and then establish your series. There'd be a filing fee for, of $100. Um, this can be done in Delaware. Um, in other states, most series LLC laws are based on Delaware. Um, formed similarly, um, file articles of organization and the financial rights. And the series is also subject to compliance requirements as a regular LLC would, such as annual report, amendment, and appointment of registered agent. In other states, um, the debts, the liabilities of the series are enforceable against the assets of the series if there's some kind of notice, um, establishes one or more series in the operating agreement, um, separate and distinct records are maintained, and the assets associated with the series are held and accounted for separately. So not very different from what you've heard in Delaware so far. Um, a few states have a series can be considered a separate entity. So this kind of shows you that it's in flux and not every state is ready for it. Um, in Texas, it provides specifically um, the series is not a separate entity. And that's very helpful when there is doubt. Um, not all states specify this and there can be changes. To have a series LLC, a public filing is required either a formation or perhaps you've got a conversion or something that's changed it. Um, so the public has to be on notice that they're dealing with a series LLC. Um, we've got Illinois, which is different from Delaware. Um, it has to contain the entire name of the LLC and it has to be distinguishable from the name of the series itself. So not only does the master series have to have a specific name, but each unit has to have a specific name as well. Um, you have to file the certificate of designation uh, to form and terminate a series. You have to have the name of the series, the name of managers, um, all the things that a typical LLC would be required upon formation. Um, and if you do that, you have that separate entity treatment. Um, and the LLC and its series can consolidate operations as a single taxpayer, work cooperatively, contract jointly so there can be savings, and elect to be treated as a single business in order to qualify in Illinois or any other state. So these choices have been applauded, but they can also cause problems. So you really have to be knowledgeable before you start an Illinois series. Um, there becomes a question, can you do business in other states? Some states recognize series, particularly if they have a domestic one, but most do not. Um, so you don't know how you'll be treated in another state or whether the series will have the liability protection they do have in their home state. Um, for purposes, I've got some tax information up here. Um, the proposed regs of the IRS would treat each series as a separate entity for tax purposes, um, and each series could check the box whether they want to be treated as a corporation or a partnership. Um, um, the regulations, although they're only proposed, they already have substantial authority behind them. Um, there's some state income tax things that you need to know about. Um, the California Tax Board doesn't authorize domestic series, but it will treat each series of a foreign SLLC that's registered as a separate LLC. So they would be subject to the minimum annual franchise tax. So there's a lot of warnings. Courts have very little case law to show for the series. Um, and there's many things that the state legislatures need to clarify. Federal and state agencies haven't ruled on the application, and due to lack of court or any kind of administrative guidance, there's a lot of uncertainties. And some of the unanswered questions are tax. Um, would the doctrine of veil piercing be applicable? 
you know, how much protection does the master have versus how much protection the series would have? Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, will a state, if it doesn't have a formation of a series, recognize the internal liability shield of the series? Um, will determination of whether a series is doing business in a foreign state differ from the termination of the regular LLC? So perhaps one series is doing business in Idaho, no other series are, how will that be taxed? Will it be considered that the LLC is doing business in Idaho or just this particular series? You know, bankruptcy petitions become an issue. Um, may a series make a filing under Article 9 of the UCC? So there's a lot of things that are still in flux. Um, I've got a few cases we'll talk about today, Alphonse versus Arch Bay and GXG Management. These are decisions dealing with the capacity of the series to sue or be sued. And neither court, as you'll see, comes to any kind of direct conclusion. But it's an illustration of some of the issues that can come about. I would also tell you that these are both in federal court, so they're not even Delaware decisions. So in Alphonse, um, there was a series LLC, and the master assigned its mortgage note to a series. Then there was a default. The series filed a petition to enforce the mortgage and foreclose on the mortgagor's home. Then the mortgagor, not wanting to lose his home, um, claimed that the master LLC was barred by race judicata um, and that it held that the Delaware law governed. So this was the district court dismissing the action. Then we have the Court of Appeals reversing. Um, they said that for race judicata to bar a claim, the court should actually have made the decision, and that did not. It was sort of just a, a determination rather than looking at the facts of the case. Um, and they also said Delaware law doesn't necessarily govern um, this case in particular because is the issue of whether the LLC or a series is liable to third parties, can, is it an internal or an external affair? So that also came up. Um, and then it was remanded to the district court to see if Delaware law governed or if there was sufficient identity of interest. And it went back to a federal trial court so this wouldn't hold very much sway as a legal ruling, but it just shows you that litigation is uncertain. GXG management is another one. We had a series LLC where the master bought a boat and formed a series to hold the title and operate the boat. Um, there were problems with the boat itself, and the master LLC sued alleging poor workmanship and misrepresentation. So the boat wasn't what it was supposed to be. Um, the master LLC wanted to amend the complaint to add the series as a co-plaintiff. But the district court didn't permit the motion and it hold, held that the master LLC could maintain the action um, even though title was held separately by a series. So again, the master didn't hold um, the series title. I'm sorry, the boat title. Um, then the district court pretty much reversed itself and amended its holdings. Um, it clarified that it was not holding the master LLC could sue on behalf of the series. So that's, to me, more than a clarification. They've changed their mind. Um, and it clarified that it was not holding that the master LLCs and the series were separate entities. So if you're not separate, you can't join. Um, and the court was holding that regardless of these issues, the master had suffered harm and could sue to recover for that harm. So that was good for those people who had the problematic boat, but it doesn't give us much help or, or information for later. So the question is, will it catch on? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think it may continue to be used as sort of a boutique item. There are over 13,000 in Nevada, 5,000 in Illinois, 
And part of the uncertainty determining whether these are series as LLCs is that not every state requires them to put series in the name. So there may be, there are more, but we just don't know which ones. Um, so I am next going to go to the question, what concerns you most about using the series LLC? And this was supposed to be a polling question. Amanda? Yes, can you tell me which polling question you're on, Tamara? 51. Which polling question? Polling question number two? Um, yeah. I believe so. It says, what most concerns you about using the series LLC? Yes, actually this wasn't set up as a polling question when we gave her the um, final presentation. Well, it, it gives you something to think about, and maybe Amanda or Victor can address the audience when I'm finished to tell them you know, how we'll handle this for CLE purposes. And now we're on to the Public Benefit Corporation. Um, they are hybrid entities. Um, part of They are for-profit and non-profit. They kind of have a blended mission. It is something that is promoting the social good, yet they want to earn profits for the owners. Um, before this, these even arose, there was Ben and Jerry's, and they tried to do that as well. And then they were sold to Unilever, and after that happened, Unilever had no obligation to continue doing what Ben and Jerry's had. Um, so these are considered incorporated social enterprises. The most common now is the benefit corporation. Um, there's also a flexible purpose corporation and social purposes. Also, there's something called the triple LC, and that is kind of like a nonprofit LLC, but that has not panned out. So a social enterprise is people start a business, they want to earn a profit, but maybe they also want to do good. Um, so maybe they start a business with a charitable purpose, um, designed to benefit society. Well, in the past, their only choice was a nonprofit corporation, but there are a lot of social entrepreneurs who think they have great ideas, and rather than just be the executive of a nonprofit with a limited salary, they want to have stock. They want to be compensated for their stock. And also, they want to have investors. So then comes the benefit corporation. Uh, it's an incorporated entity, and it may distribute profits, uh, just like a for-profit corporation, and it can have a charitable or social beneficial purpose, so that is required. Um, it addresses the need of what we call social entrepreneurs. There's estimated to have about 350 formed nationwide. Um, there's not a lot yet, but this is starting to change, and there have been a few really large ones. There was an organic baby food that was sold to Campbell's, and then there was a number, another company called Method. They had organic products, and they were sold um, to another global company. So it, it's kind of interesting to see that these are, there's growth. Um, shouldn't be confused with what's called a certified B corporation. There's an organization called B Lab, and they sort of can give their seal of approval that you are public benefiting. But it's just a, it's sort of like a charity watch organization. Um, the statutes, there's been some in Maryland, and there's about 20 right now. There's also what's called the Model Benefit Corporation Act. Delaware in, uh, enacted what they call the Benefit Corporation, and they differ in several ways from the Model Act. And since you cannot form in a Model Act state, because there's no state called Model, I'm just going to go directly to Delaware. But you will have all this in your materials. You can see there's a lot to the Model Act. And now we have the Den of Delaware Public Benefit Corporation. Um, it differs in many ways. 
First of all, at least 90% of the Delaware existing corporate shareholders have to approve a transition to be public benefit. You know, it's a huge change in the corporation. It's, it requires a large number of stockholders to approve it. The name has to contain public benefit somewhere. The public gets to be notified. Um, and they're required to put their public benefit in the certificate of incorporation, and they have to be specific. Um, and the directors have different duties. They have to, to balance the obligations for their public benefit, what they're doing, with financial obligations to the corporation. Um, and there were 158 formed the first year. Um, it's a for-profit corporation, and it's intended to, to provide some kind of benefit to the public and operate in a responsible and sustainable manner. So these are a lot of things that will probably end up in litigation over the years. These terms will be defined. Um, it's got to have a positive effect or a reduction of a negative effect. Um, and that? it can be a whole lot of things. It can be artistic, charitable, cultural, educational, environmental. There's many, many choices. Um, and there's also requirements. They, they have a provision if you'd like to form a new one. Um, if you want to convert, your 90% of your stockholders have to approve. Um, the certificate of incorporation has to have information so that the public knows what this company is doing. Um, there's various fees for incorporation. I won't read them to you, but rest assured they exist. Um, and then there are also the regular requirements as for notification to stockholders, um, traditional corporate requirements, stockholders' interests. Um, and, and so that way it is operated like a corporation, and shareholders can bring derivative suits. But there's a little bit more requirements. Um, one different thing is the reporting obligation. The annual report for these Delaware entities have to require, they have to have a whole lot more information so that the public is aware or whoever the investors are, are aware that they are actually meeting their goals. Um, and there's a bunch of different other social enterprise entities. But since none are really as popular as the Public Benefit Corporation, um, I'm going to go straight to, I believe, as our final polling question. Um, have you formed or have any of you or your clients expressed interest in any kind of social benefit entity? Mostly none. I, I'm not surprised, or the, or your clients just aren't even aware. But if some are looks to be like they're familiar with it and that they have worked with it. So out there, some people know. Um, I think we missed one last polling question that I'm going to have you do. Camera, we um, have Remember one back to the MLP, the Master Limited Partnership. Uh, what is your opinion? interesting, um, clients don't need it, or you have big investors and they're beginning to talk about it. This would probably determine where your practice is too, if you're in the, the oil or the gas drilling areas. Okay, most of it think it's interesting in theory, but probably won't use it for their clients, and I, I completely understand it. So we are officially Don, it's almost an hour, and I will turn this back to Amanda, who probably has some more housekeeping requirements. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, and thank you, Tamara Klein, for presenting. We do have some um, CLE questions that you'll need to answer in order to receive your CLE. If you're not able to answer these via the slide deck, please download the CLE survey 
from the resource widget and email that in. This um, survey is also in the reminder notice that you received this morning. Everyone that's participating as a group must also download this form and send it in. We'll go ahead and begin with the CLE survey questions. Please rate today's webinar. We're going to move on to the next one. Please rate the overall quality, one being the lowest, five being the highest. We'll move on to question number three. Please rate the written materials, one being the lowest, Five being the highest. And our last CLE question for today, please rate today's instructor. One being the lowest, five being the highest. While we're finishing up with the polling questions, we do want to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy schedules and joining our webinar today. In the event that you do not have a copy of the presentation of today, you can find it in two different places. One, you can find in the reminder that went out to you this morning. You can also find the, poll or the presentation in the resource widget, which is in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Along there in that screen, you'll also find our speaker bio, You'll find the sign-in sheet if you're participating as a group, and also the CLE survey if you're not able to excuse me, answer these questions via the slide deck. Please download it. Please do not answer them in the Q&A box for the survey. This must be completed and sent in either through the slide deck or through via the email. Again, we thank you for taking time out of your schedules. I'm going to go ahead and leave everything um, pulled up just in case you need that email address to send the um, group viewing attendance sheet that's located in the bottom of these housekeeping notes. We will conclude our call at 2.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so it's about three minutes to go ahead and finish downloading anything that you need. Thank you again. Have a great day. I did forget to mention also, if you had any questions that you wanted to ask the presenter, you can still submit those questions in the Q&A box until 2.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will get those over to the presenter, and she will get them all answered if she's able to, and we'll send them out in the thank you email. Upon completion of our webinar today, you'll receive a certificate of participation within one week of today's date. If you're seeking CLE in the states of California and New York, your certificate will be sent to you within 30 days. If you participated as a group, please make sure you download the CT Group Viewing Attendance Sheet, which is located in the resource widget in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Please download this, print it out, print nice and clear, and send it over to cls-clecredit at walterscooler.com. You'll also need to make sure that each individual completes an evaluation form and sends that in along with this form. That way everyone in the room can get attendance um, accredited. Again, thank you for joining today's webinar. Can you please mute your line? Hello, who's this? Hello? It does conclude our call. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for attending.